Greetings in the Baptist name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We want to welcome you to the First Missionary Baptist Church of Fernandina Beach, Florida, the church in the heart of the city with a desire to be in the hearts of all people. Where I serve as your senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Darian K. Bolden, Sr. This is the day the Lord has made, and we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome you to our Wednesday in the Word. Wednesday in the Word. Let us go and pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you again for being so good, so kind, and so merciful to each and every one of us. Thank you, God, for the gift of another day. Thank you for another opportunity, for oh God, to study your word, and God, for you to reveal yourself to us through your scriptures. God, we pray now that you would bless everyone who's under the sound of my weak voice. Oh God, let us hear a word from you today. Oh God, you talk to us and we'll listen to you. Not only will we listen, God, but we will obey your commands and follow your guide, your precepts, your laws, and your statutes, oh God, for our lives. Make us stronger, make us better, make us wiser, and God, make us more diligent to study your word and to be about our Father's business. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, saints and friends, we thank you for joining us here at the First Missionary Baptist Church of Fernandina Beach, Florida, located at 20 South 9th Street, Fernandina Beach, 432034. This is our Wednesday in the Word. Today we want to continue uh, in our series on the book of Acts. Our series on the book of Acts, last time we left off, we were here in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And in Acts chapter 4, our last lesson of this fourth chapter after the wonderful miracle that God had performed uh, at the gate called Beautiful, where Peter and John says to the man who was asking alms, silver and gold have we none, but such as we have give unto thee. We give unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Chapter 4, they are facing persecution for what they had done. They are facing persecution for what they done. We dealt with Acts chapter 4 verses 1 through 22 in our last setting. Today we want to deal with Acts chapter 4 verse 23 through 37. But let me bring you back up to where we were. Under the heading of persecution, under the heading of persecution, we dealt with the fact they were cast into the prison. They were cast into the prison. And in the midst of them being cast into the prison, the second thing that we saw there, they continued preaching. They continued preaching. And because of their preaching, the third thing the text is taken to show us, they had to receive punishment. And so in Acts chapter 4, under the heading of persecution, we saw the prison, first of all. We saw the preaching. But then, thirdly, we saw the punishment. But today, chapter 4, verses 23 through 31, I want to deal with power. Also, 32 through 37, I want to deal with power. The first thing that I want to deal with as it relates to power is verses 23 through 31. They had power because of the right use of prayer. They had power because of the right use of prayer. Can I read those verses in your hearing? For the text says, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our Father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers 
were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. My brothers and sisters, they had power because of the right use of prayer. Listen, listen. They were punished and after being threatened, the disciples returned to their own group, first of all, to pray. They address the God, they address God as Lord. Now what's, 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 what's not unusual, but what's, what's strange about this particular place in which they address him as Lord, it's, it's not the usual word for Lord, but it's one that really comes from the English word despot, D-E-S-P-O-T. It is used for the absolute relationship of a master to his slave. When we look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, we find it there. In Titus chapter 2, verse 9, we find it there. First Peter chapter 2, verse 18, we also find it there. But secondly, they show their recognition of the power of God. It's in the text. They said in the text, Sovereign Lord. They didn't just call him any kind of God. They said, Sovereign Lord, the one who made the heaven, the one who made the earth, the one who made the sea, and everything in it. You are the Sovereign Lord. They recognized who he was. And so they showed that recognition of the power of God, particularly as it is displayed, displayed here in the act of creation. But then, then I like what this text said because thirdly, they submitted themselves to the plan of God. Here's what they said, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentile rage? And the people's plot in vain, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate. Enemies came together to plot against you along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. You allowed this to happen. That's what basically they're saying. Listen, it was your plan. And so the book teaches us as they pray, the Spirit opened to them the meaning of Psalm 2 as it applied to the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The responsibility for that act is laid upon Herod. It's laid upon Pontius Pilate. It's laid upon the Gentiles. It's laid upon the people of Israel. The human responsibility is interwoven with the predetermined plan of God. But then fourthly, here's what they did in verse 28. He says in verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. They, pre they presented their petitions before God. Here, here's what happens when you read verse 29 and 30. They said, now Lord, this is what we need you to do. Look upon their threats. Grant to your servants that they may be able to continue to speak with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal. While you continue to perform. Listen, listen. They're not taking credit. 
but they're giving God the credit for performing miracles, signs, and wonders through his holy name, Jesus Christ. And, and so even in the stress of the situation, their prayer was filled mainly with praise instead of petition. They didn't, they, listen, they did ask for one thing. The one thing they asked for was boldness, and boldness was confirmed by the miracles. They did not ask the Lord to remove the threats, nor to relieve them of the problem, but they asked the Lord, here it is, saints, to continue to give them boldness to testify and for confirmation of their message by signs and wonders. Lord, do what you already done. Too often, too often, this text teaches us, too often when we're presented with a crisis, we want to quit. Or if not quit, we want the Lord to remove the threat. We want the Lord to take away our stumbling blocks. We want the Lord to rid us of our enemies. I come to discover opposition will keep you on your knees. He never promised us that the road would be easy. He never promised us that the gates of hell would not come against us. He said to us that the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. He said in this life, you're going to have trials in this life. You're going to have tribulations. But he also said, be of good cheer because I've already overcome the world. And so saints, my friends, my brothers, and my sisters, they didn't ask the Lord to remove their problem. They just asked the Lord for a holy boldness. They asked the Lord to confirm their message through miracles, signs, and wonders. The answer was given with another infilling of the Spirit, which was seen in this instant visibly by the shaking of their meeting place. And when they were filled again, as they had been on the day of Pentecost, they spoke the word with boldness. And so lest I hold you long today, the first thing this text is tailored to teach us is that they had power. Why did they have power? They had power because of the right use of prayer. They knew how to communicate with God. Listen, if we're going to be as strong as they were uh, in the first century church, if we're going to do what God had told and commanded us to do, if we're going to be about our Father's business, if we're going to be able to speak, stand with a holy boldness, we're going to have to have the right usage of prayer. But then, then, then they had power. Secondly, let's not hold us too long today. Verse 32 through 37. Can I read it in your, your hearing? They had power because of the right use of purse. They had power because of the right use of purse. Verse 32 to 37 says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to eat as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Money talks. It did in the early church. 
money talks. The fellowship was strengthened and the needs were met by the voluntary agreement to hold things in common. This is not Christian communism. The sale of property was quite voluntary. The right of possession was not abolished. They could still hold their land, but they did these things willingly. The community did not control the money until it had been voluntarily given to the apostles. The distribution was not made equally, but according to need. These are not communistic principles. This is Christian charity in its finest display. Let me help the church. Let me help the body of Christ today. Our world still has needs. All of our churches have what we call mission or benevolence giving. The church of God will do better when the saints of God get more concentrated and more concerned about mission rather than cause. If our giving would become mission driven rather than cause driven, the problem in too many of our churches is that we give to causes. If we think that it's a worthy cause, we'll give. If it's something that we thought of, if it's something we support, or if it's something we think is a good idea, we give. But that's not what Christian giving is really all about. Christian giving is about missions in general. And when we would come to understand that we're not cause-driven, but we are mission-driven, and we give because it's right to give, we give because people here in homeland need missions, people on foreign soil need missions, people who are working on the mission field need support. We will be much better as a body of baptized believers when we become mission driven rather than cause driven. Too many of us are cause driven rather than mission driven. The text is tailored to teach us in the first century church that they were mission driven. They gave, they brought it to the apostle street for the distribution of the saints as every man had need. So one of them, we do know what Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Barnabas had a large part in this fellowship of goods. He was a Cypriot. Evidently he was with him, called an apostle. One whose spiritual gifts was exhortation or encouragement. Here he is as an outstanding example of the love of Christ ruling the heart and displaying it in caring for other believers. Listen, they had, they had power. First of all, because of the right use of prayer. But they had power also because of the right use of purse. Listen, most churches, it doesn't matter whether you call yourself a mega church or whether you call yourself a storefront, most churches could really operate well and adequately and sufficiently if the members would just do what the Lord has commanded. If the members of the body of Christ would bring their tithes and offering to the storehouse, 
that there may be meat in the Lord's house, the church can operate sufficiently, the church can pay its bills, the church can take care of its staff, the church can do great work for the kingdom, the church can do mission work, the building projects can be well funded if the members of the body of Christ would just make the right usage of their purse. If they would give as the Lord has commanded them to give. If they would only do what the Lord said. That's, that's the difference in the 21st century church and the 1st century church. People really cared. People were really concerned about the needs of others. And so they gave willingly. They gave with cheerful hearts. They sold their possessions so that everyone would be taken care of and that no one would be in need. They were not concerned about, I got this and you don't. They were not concerned about, I live in the gay community and you live in the ghetto. They were concerned one for the other. Listen, if we, the body of Christ, want to have power, there are two things that we're going to need. We're going to have to have power through the right usage of prayer, and we're going to have to have power through the right usage of our purse. And God will bless us richly if we would do what he has commanded for us to do. Not a long, drawn-out day for us. Thank God for you tuning in at the noonday hour. Thank God for you tuning in here at the 6 p.m. hour. Not a long day, but it's a strong day. And we bid you God's blessings. If you're here and you've joined us by way of Cyber Sanctuary and you're out of the Ark of Safety, uh, we're straight away that you can direct message us and we will lead you to Christ. Listen, if you want to become a part of this local assembly, it doesn't matter where you are. You may be in California, you may be in Nebraska, you may be in Wyoming, it really doesn't matter where you are. You may be in Maine, Boston, or wherever, but you want to become a part of this body of Christ. We will accept you then as a member of the First Missionary Baptist Church. Listen, it's not about church membership, but it's about membership to the kingdom. It doesn't matter, my brothers and sisters, as long as you are a believer in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you have a right to the tree of life. And so, listen, listen, if you want to give yourself to Christ, we will lead you down that road and road. If you want to be a blessing to this ministry by sowing seed, you say, Pastor, I have a church home, but I've been being blessed by listening and tuning in to your ministry. And I want to sow seed to continue to help assist the first church with carrying out the mission, the mandate, and the lesson of God. And you want to sow seed. There are ways that you can give, my brothers and sisters, to the First Missionary Baptist Church of Fernandina Beach. Listen, whatever gift you give, no gift is too large and no gift is too small. Whatever you give, we will greatly accept it. God bless you and keep you is our prayer until we meet again. I am Reverend I'm Barry K. Bolton, the senior, senior pastor of the First Missionary Baptist Church. The church in the heart of the city with a desire to be in the hearts of all people where this year's theme is COVID. Christians operating victoriously in the midst of doubt, in the midst of discouragement, in the midst of disappointment, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of death, and in the midst of disease. We are in our third month and we're dealing with disappointment. We are still going to operate victoriously in the midst of disappointment. Our final message of disappointment will be on this upcoming service. Sunday, and we will move towards our fourth, our fourth uh, 
report uh, next month in the month of April and start dealing with darkness. We're still going to operate victoriously in the midst of it all because we serve a God who says that we're more than conquerors because he loves us. God bless you. Thank you.